Hello, and welcome to the virtual Fairview Museum. The Fairview Museum is actually open to the public now, but we are gonna to continue to bring some of our virtual programs to you so that we can continue on this discussion of the history of Fairfield and some of the great sites uh, around the town. My name is Walt Mattis. My title at the museum is Program and Volunteer Coordinator. And I am here today actually at the Powder House, the War of 1812 Powder House, it's often referred to. It's actually a small park that's located behind Tomlinson Middle School, right behind the parking lot. Uh, and the reason I'm here today is we're going to talk a little bit about this particular structure, which a lot of people aren't even aware is actually here in the town. And then we're going to talk about how this construction of this actual structure has a tie-in to a much bigger event in uh, Fairfield's history. The structure itself is actually recorded uh, in um, October of 18, uh, 1814. Uh, there's, it's recorded that there would be building of a powder house uh, at this site. And But by that point, the war had already been going on for two years. The war began in uh, June of 1812 when James Madison, James Madison, President of the United States at the time, signs a declaration of war against, of all countries, Great Britain. The war is um, challenging here on the Eastern Seaboard. Uh, there's a lot of shutting down of ports. Uh, the British Navy uh, blockades certain areas, and Long Island Sound becomes a primary area of uh, some of their uh, scouting missions, and uh, in particular, uh, the, in, um, excuse me, 1814, uh, the attack on both Essex, Connecticut and the shelling of Stonington, Connecticut. Now, Fairfield being on the coast, uh, saw ships in 1814 and 1813. Uh, in fact, in 1813, uh, Governor Cotton, uh, John Cotton Smith uh, actually comes to Fairfield, to Mill River, which is Southport. Uh, and inspects an earthworks that has been built there. We also know that there is a Fort Union in Black Rock, in the Black Rock section of Fairfield, to defend that port. Um, ships are seen uh, off of uh, Mill River, off of Southport. In fact, uh, we have accounts where people talk about they actually start gathering up all their items uh, from their homes in fear that the British are actually going to land. Uh, ship's uh, frigate uh, is spotted a few times off of, once again, Black Rock and the borough of Bridgeport. The war itself will actually uh, end uh, in 1815, uh, uh, and the word reaches Fairfield in that year. Uh, there's a huge celebration on the 24th of February. Uh, they celebrate with an ox roast on the town green. So this particular structure, the, the, the powder house, has its roots and connections to the War of 1812. But there may have also been something else at play in people's minds during the War of 1812. And that was the remembrance that only 35 years before, Crown forces had come into Fairfield and devastated a large portion of the town. In the 18th century, Fairfield has grown into a major town. Um, Fairfield was settled in 1639. So by the time of the early uh, American Revolution, uh, the town is approximately 135 years old. Uh, five, six generations of individuals have possibly uh, grown up here in the town, uh, having never seen what would have been considered the mother country at that time, which would have been Great Britain. So the people here are beginning to have feelings uh, of, for lack of a better term, independence. Uh, they're beginning to think of themselves as Americans. They don't think of themselves as colonists as much. Uh, and they're really starting to feel that they should have more say in the way that they are governed and things that are happening here in the colonies. Um, Fairfield had grown uh, during the 17th century from its original uh, settlement. That original settlement was at the intersection of Beach and Old Post Road. So today where Old Town Hall is, St. Paul's, uh, First Church Congregational, that intersection is the original settlement point. 
By the time of the late 17th, uh, early 18th century, well, actually I should say the mid 18th century, um, Fairfield has grown uh, and now has seven separate parishes. Uh, those are Reading, um, Norfield, which will eventually become Weston, uh, North Fairfield, which most of which will become uh, uh, Easton, uh, West Parish, or sometimes also known as Greens Farms, uh, which will become uh, most of Westport, a big chunk of Westport. Uh, Fairfield Parish, which is Fairfield pretty much as we know it today. Uh, Greenfield Parish, which is also today part of Fairfield. Uh, and Stratfield Parish, which gets kind of separated out uh, in 1870, a large portion of what was once Stratfield Parish actually gets brought into Bridgeport. Um, but all of those are part of the greater town of Fairfield uh, in the uh, 1750s by 1750. Um, in 1767, Reading will actually be the first uh, of those uh, parishes to, to, to separate out and become its own town. Uh, so by the time of the American Revolution, uh, Reading has, is no longer part of Fairfield. Um, but the other parishes are still connected. Um, in uh, uh, 1702, uh, Fairfield gets named as an official port of entry, a uh, lawful port of entry, uh, which is a big step uh, for, for Fairfield. Um, it's one of seven at the time. Uh, and that means that if you are bringing goods or, or, or things into the colony, it has to come through Fairfield. Now, part of that has to do with the fact that in 1666, Fairfield is set up as the county seat for Fairfield County. Now, um, that means we all county court business twice a year will happen here in Fairfield. Uh, and the, the original structure, we're not 100% sure, but later uh, in um, 1768, uh, the uh, courthouse will burn. Uh, and part of the reason that the, the original courthouse gets burned is because uh, the courthouse and the jail are actually together. They're, they're a single structure. And there's a gentleman by the name of Isaac Frazier who uh, had attempted to rob a store um, and uh, he is caught and he is put into prison in the Fairfield jail. And in an attempt to escape, he actually sets a fire, uh, which sets the jail, the structure on fire. Uh, he does get out. Uh, not sure where, where his thought process was uh, to set the building on fire, but he thought it would allow him to escape. But in that fire, uh, the, both the jail and the courthouse are burned down and rebuilt fairly soon thereafter. We know that in 17, and by late April 1768, they're already uh, talking about uh, the, the reconstruction, uh, but they do separate the two buildings. Um, and that new uh, courthouse will be built roughly where Old Town Hall is today, but the uh, jail will actually now be separate uh, and it will actually sit where the foundation of St. Paul's Church is. So that is actually where the jail is at that time. Um, so there's uh, the, in 1708, uh, Black Rock uh, becomes a, a duty port. So not only now are we a lawful port of, port of entry, but we're also a duty port. So that means that if you're bringing imported goods from other parts of the world into the, into the uh, uh, colony, you are actually having to bring it through uh, Black Rock as one of several. It's not the only one, but it's one of several um, to bring all that in. So Fairfield uh, has grown. It's roughly uh, a town of about uh, 4,900 people uh, by 1750. And uh, it's, it's a very large town. There are only a few towns that are, are, are larger than it um, as far as population goes. Um, and it's actually a fairly wealthy town also. Um, so things begin to change though. So that relationship that the colonies are enjoying and uh, feel uh, that is uh, good for them during the period uh, of the uh, mid 18th century, uh, through the era of the Seven Years War or the French and Indian War as it's often known here, um, begins to change. And part of that has to do with the fact that um, the colonies uh, 
muster militia to help the British Army here in the colonies in particular. Um, and at the end of that war, um, Great Britain starts to see an opportunity to get uh, money tax through taxes from the colonies to help rebuild uh, England's coffers. And so they begin to impose taxes. And the colonists are upset about this, not specifically because of the taxes, but the real concern that the colonists have is that they don't feel they have any say in the, A, the creation of these taxes, and B, in the way the money from these taxes gets used. So much of this money, although it's being collected here in the colonies, is not necessarily being spent here in the colonies. It's actually being used for uh, things in England. And this begins to upset the uh, colonists. And the famous line, no taxation without representation, uh, is really a key factor to this story. The other big event that's going to happen is in 1763, just at the basically at the end of the French and Indian War, um, is that uh, the uh, king, the parliament, will pass a demarcation line. They'll, it's, it's the Quebec Act. And they actually create a line that runs basically through the Allegheny Mountains. And uh, it says that the colonists can no longer uh, live west of the Alleghenies. Uh, and this is a big deal because many of the colonists, as new colonists are coming in, are looking to uh, you know, move out to the west. And this has now been cut off to them. Uh, in fact, that land is promised to the Native Americans that it supported England during the French and Indian War, during the war against France. Um, so the Native Americans that had supported Great Britain uh, are, are being provided uh, through this act. But it upsets the colonists and felt they felt that they had no say in it, that they had not been asked or consulted in this, in, in this story. In 1765, there's the Stamp Act, and that's kind of a big line in the sand for many of the colonists. And the Stamp Act basically said that paper goods had to bear a certain stamp that you had to pay uh, a tax on. Um, it was very, very unpopular. Uh, we know that in uh, December, many of the towns in Connecticut uh, are, um, are, are having uh, resolutions to support uh, the, the protestation of the Stamp Act. And by 1766, the Stamp Act is repealed. Uh, that repealing of that act is kind of a double-edged sword. Um, it's good because the colonists don't have to pay the tax. Uh, but it's bad because it kind of puts a feeling in Parliament in the King that these colonists feel like, wow, you know, if they don't like something, they just don't have to do it. They're just going to protest and they're going to stop it. Uh, and so it really opens up a kind of a Pandora's box, if you will, of um, acts that are coming from the King, from Parliament, to kind of help, if you will, <laughs> the colonists to understand that the government is who's in charge and, and, and the colonists aren't really having it. Um, and so we see a series of uh, acts and uh, protestations here in the colonies uh, over the period. Um, big uh, event will of course be in 1770 with the uh, Boston Massacre. Um, which really kind of sets the stage uh, for uh, much further action. A group of British soldiers from the 29th of foot uh, are provoked, in particular one so soldier who's standing guard uh, is provoked. Uh, his fellows come out and a, um, they're, there's a huge mob. Uh, they're throwing rocks and, and things and the troops fire and uh, it becomes an issue so much so that it becomes a point where people begin communicating with one another and this is a key thing uh, in 1773 in Connecticut now in 17 late 1772 November of 1772 committee of correspondence correspondence is created in Massachusetts but by 1773 there's a committee of correspondence here in Connecticut and um, Thaddeus Burr will actually be a member of that uh, Committee of Correspondence. Uh, but it creates a way, and there's all the colonies will eventually have their own groups of committee, uh, committees uh, that allow the colonies to communicate with one another 
about issues uh, that they feel are, are, are coming about through uh, the events that are going on. Um, by 1774, there are roughly 4,800, 5,000 um, persons living in uh, Fairfield. There is roughly between 250 and possibly 300 enslaved persons uh, in Fairfield, uh, Africans, uh, slaves here uh, in, in Fairfield. And the, uh, to put that in a little bit of comparison, um, New Haven, which is the largest uh, town in or city in Fairfield at the, uh, excuse me, in Connecticut at the time, has roughly a little over 8,000, about 8,300 people living in it. So, um, and then the next lowest after that is Hartford at 5,000, uh, Middletown and then Fairfield. So Fairfield is actually the fourth largest town by population in the entire colony of Connecticut in 1774. Um, an interesting side note, in 1774, in March of 1774, the Burr Homestead gets robbed, silver items are taken. Um, so uh, the, um, we know that in 1774, John Adams, on his way to the First Continental Congress, will stay at the Bulkley Tavern. Uh, in fact, he speaks of uh, Thaddeus Burr coming to, to visit with him. Um, and then uh, the, uh, in um, October of 1774, in support of Boston, so Boston eventually will uh, the British Navy and Army will come in, they'll blockade the port. Um, and so Fairfield, in support of Massachusetts, will actually uh, send uh, uh, about 900 bushels of rye and about 150 bushels of wheat uh, to help support uh, uh, Boston uh, through the winter uh, as part of a support of, and sign of solidarity with Boston. Um, so. Um, and in December, uh, Fairfield will approve and ratify uh, the uh, First Continental Congress, uh, basically has a uh, document that says, that they send to uh, Great Britain that says, you know, uh, you know, like what's going on and, and what have you. And Fairfield will actually in December support it. It will actually step up and support it. Um, by 1777, uh, the, uh, excuse me, <laughs> the war breaks out in 1775, um, and, uh, word reaches Fairfield on April 22nd, and fairly soon thereafter, uh, a, a company of Fairfield Militia will actually be sent, uh, to, uh, help support, uh, the troops at, Mass in Massachusetts that are, uh, gathering, uh, around Boston. Um, Fair, Connecticut's militia uh, had already started to begin to get ready uh, as early as uh, um, 1774 and early 1775. Uh, the governor and uh, the, the Connecticut legislature is pushing to make sure that all militias are fully uh, prepared, that they have officers and, and all their enlistments are uh, set and, and they have the proper numbers. Uh, and are drilling on a regular basis. Usually they would drill at least twice a year during that window. They begin to drill three and four times a year uh, to get together and practice uh, to, to train. So when those troops are, when, when the company from Fairfield is going, they're, they're quite prepared and ready uh, for, for the engagement. Um, by 1776, uh, the um, Fairfield uh, is has a large number of individuals in the militia in particular uh, that actually are part of something that's known as Wadsworth Brigade. Wadsworth Brigade uh, will actually in August of 1776 will uh, be part of uh, the Battle of Brooklyn, the Battle of Long Island. Uh, they'll be part of uh, the, the first large um, uh, battles in the New York area. Um, and many of those individuals are uh, are, are buried uh, actually in the Greenfield burial ground. There's a large number uh, actually buried there. So the um, other side that we do see uh, individuals uh, from Fairfield becoming part of 
uh, includes uh, the uh, uh, naval. Uh, Connecticut has its own navy. There are privateers. Now, privateers are people who are uh, hired by either the state. They're private individuals, but they're hired by the state or the uh, uh, federal government, at the, that time the Continental Congress, to arm their ships and fight for them. Uh, and Connecticut does have many privateers. Many of them are going in and out of uh, Black Rock Harbor, which at the time is part of Fairfield. Uh, but we also see uh, individuals like uh, Jonathan Maltby, whose home stands on Beach Road, uh, who actually uh, joins the Continental Navy, and he will actually be a second lieutenant aboard uh, the, the uh, ship Alfred. Uh, we also uh, see um, soldiers, uh, Marines, uh, Thomas Elwood, uh, who will in 1776, will actually, excuse me, 1777, will actually uh, become a lieutenant in the Marines uh, aboard a ship called the Alliance. Um, and then there's also the Connecticut State Navy, which included a ship named the Defense uh, and Samuel Smedley. Uh, will actually uh, join the crew in 76, 1776, but he'll eventually, by 1777, he'll be captain uh, of the defense and he will command it uh, until 1779. And we do know that he does bring the defense here to Fairfield uh, in Black Rock a, a few times to, uh, um, to supply and, and get crew. The uh, in 1777, we do know that seven British uh, vessels appear off the coast of uh, Mill River uh, and that they do uh, embark troops, uh, but they're repulsed, so they don't actually get a chance to land. Um, they're, they're fought off. Um, in 1778, uh, uh, the um, Marquis de Lafayette, there's a story that he comes to Fairfield. He stays with Thaddeus and Eunice Burke. Uh, in August of 1778. And by December of 1778, uh, we see the arrival of troops in uh, what is known as Camp Redding, uh, two New Hampshire regiments and a, uh, some Connecticut uh, troops, as well as um, uh, a Canadian regiment, uh, all in camp at what is known as Camp Redding today. Part of what was the greater Camp Redding is Putnam Park. Uh, so by 1778, uh, the, the war is, is moving in different directions. Uh, the, there are a lot of things going on. Um, so we're going to use that to help set our stage. Uh, we have two more installments uh, for this. So I hope that you'll tune in uh, as we progress forward. Uh, once again, my name is Walt Mattis, uh, and I hope you've enjoyed. Uh, if you are interested in becoming a member of the Fairfield Museum or helping us out uh, through donation, uh, please go to our website, uh, fairfieldhistory.org, uh, um, where you can learn more about uh, doing those things as well as uh, uh, helping to support. So once again, thank you so very much. And uh, I look forward to seeing you on the History Trail.